Hello, everybody. Welcome back to How Come. Sorry, it's been a little while. I was sleeping. Also, thank you so much to everybody who came to the Arlington, D.C. area shows. They were so fun. It was so nice to meet those of you who I met. Um, I got to meet Molly from last week's episode, and uh, she told me about the um, adventure that her and her boyfriend went on. I also met him, a dream. Um, And their adventure... Maybe I'll record it with her for Patreon. But their adventure was basically they had to make up a bunch of sex positions that they were given like the names and they had to like make them up. And outside of the show, she showed me what they did using me as the boyfriend and her. We we all consented to everything. We were like, are you comfortable? I'm comfortable. And it was so funny. And they're so creative and they're so different than the ones I would have come up with. So maybe I'll post that video on Patreon because Chanel... um, film the whole thing also thank you to chanel ali for opening for me she is so fucking funny if you're not following her already because of this podcast follow her if you love comedy and i love chanel so shout out to her also she taught me how to get tips in my link tree so i put it in my personal link tree for remy casimir if you see me do stand up you can tip that now so cool and um then i was like robin we should do this for how come too? Because so many people have asked us, what's something that like we can just donate to you instead of joining the Patreon? Like we don't want to do like a recurring thing. Um, we don't even want extra content necessarily. Like we just want to support the podcast. Now you can check out the link tree in How Come Podcast on Instagram and it'll say tip how come. And there are a bunch of fun little amounts. There are some bigger amounts you can put in your own amount. Yes, 69 is already an option. Um, But anything that you can give us, we are so, so grateful. And it just helps us create a better, bigger, easier flowing podcast. Um, Today's episode is awesome. Last week, we were talking about female birth control. Today, we are talking male birth control and several other things with Dr. Justin Hooman, a reproductive urologist and men's health specialist in Beverly Hills. He's a fellowship trained male reproductive medicine and surgery specialist whose practice is focused on men's health, including male hormone management, sexual and ejaculatory dysfunction, male fertility, male incontinence, and Peyronie's disease. As a minimally invasive microscopic surgeon, he specializes in microsurgical varicoselectomies, vasectomy reversals, sperm retrievals, penile implants, and more. Um, His practice is centered on enhancing men's quality of life through hormone management, improving sexual function, and achieving reproductive goals. Um, He only treats cis men, um, and we talk about that in this conversation, so that's why a lot of the verbiage is like men, men, men. Um, He also gave us a great uh, surgeon that he knows who treats other people with penises as well as Uh, trans men who have had penile surgeries. Um, So we are going to hopefully get that doctor on as well. But if you are a cis man and you want to hear about stuff, Dr. Justin Hooman is your guy. Um, And we're really excited to have him on the pod. He also said, if you have any other questions, you can reach out to him personally, or he would be happy to come back on the podcast. So you can send us your questions, send them to us, send them to him. Doesn't matter. Hopefully we can get them answered. But we answer a lot of stuff in this episode. It is truly jam packed. I think you're really going to enjoy it. And I can't wait for you to hear it. Let's go. How come? How come? How come I can't achieve? How come I can't achieve? I'm rolling up my sleeves. I'm rolling up my sleeves. Oh, baby, I believe these guests can help. Cause I can do it by myself. I wanna jizz. Hello. That was me. That was an ungodly sound, Robin. This is not how we greet our esteemed guests. <laughs> Hello. How are you? Good. So excited to have you here. Welcome, Dr. Justin Hooman. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. Um, we have been talking about infertility, birth control, and we're excited to talk to you because you focus on male infertility and reproductive urology. Can you tell us how you got into that field? Yeah, so men's health. Mm-hmm. Which it's like a broad, it's a broad field of men's sexual health and reproductive mm-hmm. health. Um, basically, it's a it's a small subspecialty within the field of urology. Mm-hmm. So I'm a urologist by trade, and I did a residency in urology. During that time, I noticed there's a huge hole in terms of there's not a lot of doctors who help address young guys' needs. Mm. Like ob women have OBGYNs, um, men don't have that. So what male reproductive urology is, it helps address that same gap of guys between 20 and 50 were an outlet for them as a as a physician not just for their sexual health reproductive health but 
overall health. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny for us to hear like, oh, there's no one for penises. Like vulvas have everything because usually it's the other you know, way. we feel very flipped. Yeah, that most of medicine is catering towards people with penises versus people without. And people start caring about penises at the age of 50, usually. But now we're trying to change mm-hmm. that. We're starting to care about that a little bit, a little bit younger and a little bit earlier. Do you think that's because there's like a stigma about talking about it when you're younger? For sure. Yeah. For sure. I think there's just the macho mentality. But I think a lot of things in society, and we could talk, talk more about that, but a lot of things in society are pushing towards addressing it earlier because there's a lot of anxiety for young guys mm. associated with anything related to their penis. Mm -hmm. So what are people mostly coming to you for? Two things, reproductive issues Mm -hmm. and then difficulty um, with sex. So whether it's the main one being erectile dysfunction, Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many young guys, like early 20s, Mm -hmm. are having erectile dysfunction issues, um, testosterone issues, issues with either orgasming too soon, too late, um, essentially everything involved in sex and reproduction. Mm -hmm. How do you know because I'm thinking about this from like our standpoint, we're always like, oh, however you come, whenever you come is good. Like, how would you know if you're coming too early or too late or if that's like just what your body does? So there's no hard and fast rule, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like if you're doing it below two minutes, you have a problem Mm -hmm. or if you're doing it longer than an hour, you have a problem. It's it's all in the context of your relationship with your partner. If you guys are both sexually satisfied, you and your partner are sexually satisfied, then there's no issue right then you shouldn't be there's not anything there's no there's basically you're in you're in parallel you're in harmony Mm -hmm. but if in fact one of you one of you is um taking too long or too it's too soon uh, and it's impacting the satisfaction of the of the other individual then i would say hey listen you should probably talk about it um and potentially seek consultation about it but Mm -hmm. um See, I see somebody else coming quickly. I'm like, huzzah, (laughs) like you're done work on me. Or like even in the context of just being alone, like a good orgasm for me. I'm like, yeah, that's under two minutes. Mm -hmm. Over two minutes is like, that's too much time. Too much effort. So you only give them one shot. That's it. Who? I mean, you only let them, you only give them one opportunity if they don't, if they don't. uh... (laughs) Oh my God, definitely not. No, if it's like you're done, then it's like work on the other person. Then like you can come again. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, oh my God, of course. Everybody should be coming as much as they can. Amen. But um, I guess it's for people who like want a longer lasting thrusting kind of set, sexual experience. You know? Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean? That's why they come in? Yeah. They usually come in because their partner is unhappy. Right. I'm saying because right? the partner wants a longer lasting thrusting experience for them. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and how is that treated? Is it the same across the board? Or are there different reasons for um, coming too quickly or too long? Yes, yeah, so coming too quickly is actually easier to treat than not coming fast enough. Mm. Um, so it's all it's all it's all hormone related, mm-hmm. right? There's various hormones. So for coming too quickly, there's there's sprays. It's like basically a lidocaine spray that you could put on your penis and it desensitizes it just enough. Okay. Those, those, I'll be honest with you, they generally don't work that well. Okay. There's some newer therapies out there with amino acids um, that could delay some of the nerve conduction. But historically, I guess the, the mainstay, um, one thing that's generally works for most people is, so SSRIs, I don't know how familiar you are with antidepressants. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We did a whole episode on SSRIs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so SSRIs, one of the side effects is an ejaculation, mm-hmm. right? Not being able to ejaculate mm-hmm. because of some of the various hormones that inter- uh, that plays on it um, in the brain. Mm-hmm. But um, so we give them we give them a, very, a a smaller dose, a baby dose of these SSRIs, and by doing so, you're not getting any of the therapeutic benefits. You're only getting the side effect, which is delayed mm-hmm. orgasm. So these guys are who are prematurely ejaculating, then it pushes them into the normal range. They're getting normal ejaculations. But- and then their partners are happy. And then oh, <laughs> the partners are happy because more thrust. Yes, more thrust. More thrust, <laughs> more smiles. <laughs> but what if they're already on SSRIs for whatever reason, and then you mm-hmm. can't necessarily give them the smaller dose because they've already got a higher dose. How then do you? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so a couple of things. So s- some SSRIs act on this ejaculatory pathway better than others. Mm-hmm. So at that point, I would have I would have a discussion with, um, generally it's their psychiatrist who's prescribing this. 
um, potentially about switching into one of those medications that provides the mental, I mean, the, the antidepressive benefits while at the same time addressing the ejaculation. Mm-hmm. Um, usually it's, you, you have to have a discussion in terms of potentially even putting them on a smaller dose of the other SSRI at the same time. But ultimately it's a, a cocktail, case by case if you would. Um, <laughs> situation. Nice. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully you're not putting them on too many, mm. too many of these SSRIs. Did you get that though, Dr. Yeah. Herman? Cocktail? I, got, I get that. Okay. Great. <laughs> it just yeah, wasn't good. I hear, okay, the, I, I hear these jokes. <laughs> oh, okay. No, no. <laughs> I hear them. Amazing. I heard. Good job. Oh, yeah. Patients make all kinds of jokes. These one-liners mm-hmm. uh, in clinic too. Yeah. Zingers. A lot of zingers. Amazing. I would. Cool. Um, and then for the people who are not able to come for a long time, the long thrusters that we should just match up with these other partners. <laughs> How uh, do you treat them? That one's a little harder to treat. Mm-hmm. Again, it's hormonal, um, but it's, you know, there's different options for that. For that. There's oxytocin, mm-hmm. which uh, um, oxytocin is basically that hormone that we release after orgasm. Mm-hmm. That's kind of that love love connection hormone tricks you into liking people right 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 <laughs> um there's sprays you could do a nasal spray for that there's some you know hormonal management in terms of boosting up their testosterone levels that one's a hard one mm. to be honest I have, a, I have a fair number of patients who come in and you really have to throw the whole kitchen cabinet at them just to see what works best each person responds to different treatments yeah. better for that one or yeah just find them somebody who enjoys a long sesh <laughs> maybe a, a tantric practitioner I mean, to be honest, yeah to be honest, it's a lot of guys wish they were they were lasting forever sure, like that. Yeah. Everyone everyone thinks the grass is greener on Everybody the other side. Everybody wants you know? what they don't have. Mm-hmm. So wherever you are, Precisely. you're fine. But also if you need to see a doctor, go see a doctor. That's right. Something that's a little more um, defined because like this is like subjective, whether you enjoy coming quicker or later or whatever, but like you also talk about male infertility. What is uh, male infertility? How does that start and what does it look like? There's two main classes of infertility or there's three types of come mm-hmm. in. Either they're producing completely normal, all their sperm's completely normal. And there's a couple of parameters we look at. There's really four main parameters. We look at the number of sperm they're producing, how the sperm look in terms of their shape, mm-hmm. um, and then how they're, how they're moving. And so most guys ejaculate, I don't know, anywhere from, I'd say on average, anywhere from 30 to 50 million sperm per ejaculation, mm-hmm. right? Um, only 4% of them actually have to look normal, right? you know, worldwide. If you look at the data, mm-hmm. only 4% of them have to look more normal and only 40% of them have to be swimming in the right direction. The bar is low. No, I'm just kidding. The bar is low, surprisingly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the fourth component that we look at is we look at the volume. So there's three types of guys. There's guys who are producing normal counts. There's guys who are producing low counts. And there's guys who are producing no sperm. Mm-hmm. Now, the guys who are producing normal counts, they're not coming to me, mm-hmm. right? Those guys are going out there. They're, they could spit and get somebody pregnant. <laughs> the ones that are um, I hope not. <laughs> the ones who have no sperm or low sperm, they come in. So sometimes there's genetics. Some guys come in genetically. They've been dealt a hand where they can never produce sperm. Mm. Um, and it's unfortunate, but sometimes you go in there and, you know, doing a sperm bi- or testicular biopsies, we could go in there and remove single sperm at a time. Um, you could get maybe five, 10, 20 individual sperm, um, combine that with IVF, um, where they basically go in there and they implant or they inject or implant this uh, sperm right into the egg. And you could cross your fingers and hope that they could achieve a pregnancy mm-hmm. that way. Um, and other times guys come in with low sperm counts because of lifestyle issues, hormone issues, those being the two main ones, or even anatomic issues. And we're able to correct those guys and get them to normal sperm counts. Cool. What kind How of, would somebody sorry. know their sperm count is low? Like, could you just look at your own cum and be like, there's no guys in here? Or, you know, like, is it a, a visual thing at all? Or No, it's, the, I mean, really the only way of knowing is doing a semen analysis. Okay. Right. That's it. You could be the healthiest guy in the world and... Genetically, you just have a p- particular gene that doesn't allow you to produce um, sperm. Mm. Uh, but yeah, there's no, there's truly no way of knowing. Okay. Unless you do a semen analysis. So it's like usually the people coming to you, they've already been trying with a partner and it's not been working. Yeah. They've mm-hmm. tried for about six months. Generally, I say if, if, if you've been trying for six months, mm-hmm. really trying for six months and you still haven't done, you know, achieved pregnancy, then not just you, but your partner, both of you should, should go get, evaluated. yeah. 
Um, and you were saying that there are lifestyle issues that can cause a low sperm yeah. count. What are those? So the the testicles, essentially, mm-hmm. they like to live in a very narrow temperature range. Me too. And so that's why we have the scrotum, right? The scrotum relaxes and contracts, trying to basically keeping, it's like a, it's like a, a thermostat, mm-hmm. basically. It keeps those testicles within that particular temperature range. When it's too hot outside, you know, it really relaxes. Your body temperature is high. It relaxes and keeps it away from your body. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways. So the big one being guys, some guys do hot yoga every day, sauna, steam rooms, jacuzzi, uh-huh. and they're exposing their testicles to high temperatures for mm-hmm. day on day in and day out. That could decrease your sperm counts. Um, cigarette smoking, vaping, marijuana to a certain extent, um, laptops on your lap. So anything that is uh-huh. increasing the temperature there. So leaving the laptop on your lap could impact it. Cell phones to a certain extent could also impact oh, it. No. Leaving your cell phone in your front pocket. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I usually tell guys, if you're going to put it in your pocket, put it in your back pocket. Or when you come home, don't even leave it in your pocket. Just keep it away from mm-hmm. you. When you're driving, whatever it is, keep it away from your uh, your groin area. That's the temperature stuff. And then, life's, and then that overall health. If you're not exercising, if you're not moving, if you're not eating right, if you're not sleeping, all these things can impact your testosterone levels. And we know sperm need naturally produced testosterone levels to thrive. Okay. So, so those are some of the lifestyle impacts. Totally. Do you often see a change if they stop those things? And if so, how quickly? Many times. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so sperm, from the time of essentially being born to being ready to be ejaculated or you know, ready for, for prime time, mm-hmm. it's about two and a half months, roughly two and a half months. So um, let's say you're, you smoke a lot of cigarettes. If you quit, if you go cold turkey and you stop, and that's impacting your, your fertility, within two or three months, you'll notice a benefit wow. of you know, improvement in your sperm counts. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, exercise, weight loss, all of these things, yeah, you generally notice it pretty quick. That's fun. Mm-hmm. We're, meant to, we're, we're meant to procreate, right? Mm-hmm. Our bodies, evolutionarily, we're meant to procreate. So um, it's a pretty resilient system in our body. Your body wants to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the purpose. Of, you know, that's a big purpose of what we are. Sometimes like too animals. resilient. Sometimes you're getting <laughs> pregnant with an IUD, and you're like, "God damn these childbearing <laughs> hips." <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've been talking about there's a new male birth control coming out. So it's not out yet, but um, there have been a few forms of them. Um, I mean, the, the traditional one is a vasectomy. Not everyone's right. familiar with a vasectomy, yeah. right? And um, which. It's, it's excellent if you know once mm-hmm. once you're deemed sterile after a vasectomy it's it's the great. race is over <laughs> the race is over every every guy should really if you're not it's only fair for a guy to get a vasectomy after everything that the that their partner goes through I, you should get a vasectomy because it's quick it's easy Amen. um <laughs> yeah yeah i mean <laughs> Yeah, and it's easy. I mean, it's it's relatively straightforward. And then you could reverse it too. Mm-hmm. So I do a lot of vasectomy reversals. Mm-hmm. So need be if you want to have another child, you could reverse it. Um, but yeah, there's these newer, these newer hormonal male um, options. There's hormonal options. There's this um, there's this thing that they're I think they're doing it in India. They inject the gel into the vas deferens. Mm-hmm. It's a temporary gel that they inject in there, and it obstructs the path of the sperm. And then if you ever want to reverse it, you inject. Like the enzyme that breaks down that gel. Cool. I love these options. Mm, yeah. Be great. Have people, have patients been coming in talking about hormonal options with you? For male fertility? No. no. Okay. No, not so much. The one, I think the, the, the one you were, you're talking about the one that was, I think it was probably something on, on the on social media about a month ago. The yes, one you're talking about. Quite recently, they had lots of studies coming out that they were trying something new and it seemed like it was going to be 99% effective. Right, right. It's inevitable. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just not, a, it's not commercially available. It's not available to the masses quite yet, but you're right. It is inevitable and that will, that time will come. There's no question about it. Do you think a vasectomy is the best option if you want to not get someone pregnant it, it depends on what stage of life you're in if you mm. if you've had kids and you're you're married mm-hmm. yeah for sure mm. because the alternative is what your spouse is going to be on hormones for the rest of their life um yeah. well or until, until menopause. menopause yeah so in, in many ways it's, it's un- unfair it's unnecessary just mm-hmm. a vasectomy is a outpatient procedure the recovery is a few days um and you're good to go the stress the anxiety associated with sex is with you know the concern of having another child, all that's gone. Yeah. 
And what is the success rate of a reversal? Good question. So it depends. Generally, under seven to 10 years, it's almost 100%. The longer you are out from the vasectomy itself, Mm. Uh, just think about it. There's more scar tissue. pressure. There's more backlog because your testicles are still producing sperm. It's just not coming out. Uh-huh. So the more it produces, at some point, it keeps producing it and develops a little bit of pressure on itself, and then that could cause some problems after ten years. Where does it go? It just hangs out. It just so what happens? Is it's producing it and then dies off. If you're not, if you don't, if you don't use it, it dies off. You lose it. <laughs> basically, it's like a recycling process. Can you have? <laughs> If you don't Multiple use it, you lose vasectomies? It. Like if they, someone came in and had a vasectomy and then they like reversed it and then after that seven years or whatever, they were like, actually, I want another one. Can they have another like one? Like Michael Scott. <laughs> Keep having them. Yeah, exactly. Was from that, from the office yeah. episode. Yeah, exactly. Snip, snap, snip, snap. <laughs> um, so <laughs> yeah, you could you could get a vasectomy, you could reverse it and then you could get another vasectomy. Yeah, absolutely. But it would have to be in those. Yeah, but I don't think. Timely windows. Yeah, and then, but re- reversing twice, like doing two vasectomy reversals, the chances of success on that are pretty low. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, because yeah. we were talking about um, female birth control options last week, and we did a whole bunch of polls on the Instagram about the male birth control and like, would you want to take a hormonal birth control? And people were saying like, yeah, but now like this makes my vasectomy feel like, well, why did I get it? And I'm like, well, a vasectomy is still really, really good. Um, and But we were asking, we were like, do you, would you rather have two surgeries, you know, like a vasectomy and a reversal or be on a pill? And most people were like, oh, I'd rather be on a pill. But then we were like, well, what about um, for female birth control? Would you rather be on a pill or have like an I, two IUD surgeries? And I'm like, oh, two IUD surgeries. And then we were talking about the pain that you go through, oh, do you think you have more pain in an IUD insertion and removal or a vasectomy and reversal? And I was really shocked at how many people said definitely the IUD because we don't get um, pain medication and the recovery is a lot longer. Like I was recovering for a month, whereas one of the companions I was talking to said that his recovery was like a week from his vasectomy. Yeah. Yeah. The vasectomy is, the recovery is no more than a week. That's awesome. Wow. Well, a month. Yeah. It sucked. Um, wow. I'm a hero, but just like growing up, I always thought a vasectomy sounded like the most painful thing that you could do mm. to a person. Like because of all of the talk of like, oh, don't touch their balls and they're so sensitive and then, you know, like you're like, oh, you, you're ruining this person. And it's like, it seems pretty non-invasive. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's you know a single incision, and most people most people are you know just inject a little bit of local anesthetic in there. And I mean, we do a ton of them in the office every week. Mm-hmm. How long does it take? Ten, ten right. minutes, fifteen minutes. I didn't have any anesthesia for IUD. Oof. That's crazy. They give you like a Tylenol after. That, yeah, that is crazy. It's wild. And we've we had so many people sending in stories like. Yeah, I had a panic attack during because it was so painful and like I only got offered a Tylenol and it's a surgery. Yeah. Well, and, and it's a very sensitive part of your body. You have a ton of nerves yeah. there. That's the thing. So you're going to feel a light pinch yeah. and a, allegedly that same pinch is the same pain level as a heart attack. To be like, fair, my, my IUD didn't hurt like at all. She was like, it's going to hurt at this point. And then I was like, are you going to do it? And she was like, I'm done. And I was like, Whoa. Uh, but I think I just have blessed. a higher pain threshold because I broke my wrist and didn't realize it was broken. Like, so that could just be yeah. a me thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're weird. <laughs> but yeah, no. Um, but the people who are getting vasectomies, generally their pain is pretty low. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, for the most part, I mean, guys are back to normal. So like here, the typical story is, um, so during March Madness, you know, the first weekend of March Madness, even up until the second mm-hmm. weekend, it's pretty common for guys to come in on Wednesday or Thursday. They come in for a vasectomy and what? then they're on the couch. Yeah, because they're on the couch. for. Basically, you recommend them to be on the couch for a few days. So just take it easy with ice on your testicles. Uh-huh. Um, so they'll they'll hang out. They'll hang out that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just watching TV, right? Watching the March Madness they game. They schedule their vasectomies and then by Monday, they're to, good to go. watch basketball. <laughs> Yeah, it's called the March Madness Oh my goodness. The snip your balls mm-hmm. to watch some ball. 
Yeah, Snip City. Snip, Snip City, City, the second one. Oh, my God. That is so funny. Urologist across the country reported as much as a 50% increase in the number of vasectomies scheduled leading up to March Madness. That's insane. Oh, my God. We need more sporting events so everyone yeah. can just get <laughs> snipped. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's actually crazy. Nothing for the Olympics? That, huh? <laughs> Nothing for the Olympics. Or it's not as, it's not it's as not prominent. It's not as prominent. The Olympics. But that... Yeah, that's the only one where guys come in. They're like, "Yep, I'm just gonna hang out for the next few days, watch basketball." That's nice. Wow, that's amazing. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. Do your emissions change after a vasectomy? No. So, okay. um, like what they look like, what they so feel nothing like. Nothing changes. N- no, nothing really changes. Your erections don't change. Mm-hmm. Your testosterone production doesn't change. Um, your sensation sex still feels the same if sometimes the guys will say it's even more pleasurable because there's no anxiety oh, um that you're gonna fun. um yeah so the emission i'll tell you the emission part so testicles only the testicles are really giving one percent of all the volume to for you know for ejaculation all that semen that comes mm-hmm. out the sperm is only one percent of it the rest of it is just the nutrients and some of the um uh chemicals and whatnot that make it a more make the, the vagina a little bit more of a habitable environment for the sperm to, to move through. So 99% of it is still being ejaculated. Um, there's fructose, there's some um, various pH balancing uh, enzymes that help the sperm Healthy. Uh, mature the sperm. Well, yeah, I guess you can make that argument. <laughs> But yeah, very very little of it is actually from the testicle. Your your volume doesn't change one bit. You don't have to eat healthy. Just get your nutrients every day via cum. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's good. I feel like a, like a lot of people worry about oh, it's going to change my orgasms or what it looks like or I won't be able to like bust as big. Not at all. No, not not at all. Cool. Yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions with that. Like yeah. they don't want to be like I don't want to be a leaky faucet. Not at be all. A thing. You'll you'll no, still no. be, you'll be back a normal. geyser. Um, do um, I, I said this last week, and I wonder if it's a doable thing because I said if I grew up having a penis, the second I was sexually active, I would want a vasectomy, but then I would want to store my sperm. Is that a possibility, or is that a dream of mine? <laughs> uh, no, no, people do that. People do that. Oh, people cool. bank their sperm. Yeah, people bank their mm-hmm. sperm. Guys like in their, uh, I'd say I've only done the earliest I probably did for a guy like that is probably in his late 20s. Um, mm-hmm. He went bank, banked his sperm. Obviously, he's interested in having children. Um, right. But, you know, he was going to do it 10 years down the road at least. So either he was going to use his banked sperm or um, reverse his vasectomy and then. Uh, naturally try to conceive the one thing the one thing that mm-hmm. it's people have to know about when you when you have sperm like banked sperm essentially two things mm-hmm. number one the fr- you know, freezing it and then thawing it you lose about 50 percent right 50 percent of them die off just from the thaw mm-hmm. cycle um okay. and then the other thing yeah the other thing is um if you're if you're using that kind of sperm frozen sperm you're mm-hmm. committed to you're going to have to, you can't just naturally use that sperm to conceive. You're going to have to find a way of, we call it assisted reproductive techniques. Basically mm-hmm. you have to find a way of getting that sperm into the uterus or into the, um, the female reproductive tract. So it's not, it's not like you could, you know, you ejaculate can't pop it, it back in. up the penis. No, <laughs> no, no. Yeah. So you have to do either like IUI, uh, intrauterine, insemin- intrauterine okay. insemination, Basically, mm-hmm. it's like you put the sperm in a turkey baster and you squeeze it and it goes into her cervix and it sits mm-hmm. in the uterus um, or IVF, which is in vitro fertilization. And in vitro is different because you're taking the egg out? Exactly. So the, in vitro is you actually using ultrasound. You're removing the eggs, as many eggs as you possibly can, and then you're fertilizing the, the egg with the sperm in a test tube or outside. Cool. Have you heard of penile prostheses? Yeah, I was thinking about that. What? I saw a video on your own, like <laughs> YouTube. I've seen a lot of them on HBO Max this this year. But you do? Yeah, there was like a lot of fake dicks on, on HBO. No, this is not. This is not that? It's not a fake dick. No, it's not a fake dick. Well, it kind of is. What is this? Dick. So this is for guys who they can't have erections, right? So 
you know, we all think we all think Viagra and Cialis um, is the gold standard, and it works. Viagra and Cialis work for a large number of guys, mm-hmm. but it doesn't work for everyone. It probably works for about two thirds of guys, older guys. And if that doesn't work, if Viagra and Cialis don't work, then we have a couple other options. There's like injections directly into the penis. There's shockwave therapy. There's stem cell therapy. All these different things. And then if those don't work then the real gold standard is the penile prosthesis, the inflatable penile prosthesis. It's a surgery where we basically put in cylinders into the penis, two cylinders into the two mm-hmm. erectile bodies of the penis. There's a pump that sits in between the testicles. And then there's they a- They re- had a, this on mm. Sex in the City. Yeah, probably. Trey could not have erections and Charlotte was looking into this and he was like, how dare you? Yeah, so that's what it is. And it works great. It works wow. great. Wow. Yeah, you just pump. You literally pumping it up. So it's just like a couple of pumps, like Squ- like. Well, it's more the... than that. It's probably like ten to fifteen pumps. Yeah. Where's between... the pump in the balls? Everything is everything's underneath the skin, but yeah. So between you just the like testicles. have to squeeze in between your testicles every time you want to like raise it. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it just lifts. I have to do that to get Ben a boner too. He's Clear always just like balls, squeeze my balls. <laughs> Maybe he's got. Some maybe, plumbing maybe I didn't know about. Maybe, yeah, maybe he's got a prosthesis. <laughs> cool. And and it feels the same? Like the sensation for the erection is the same? Yeah, the nerves. You're not touching any of the nerves. If anything, orgasm is better because you just, and, and you're getting this very strong erection and it lasts forever, right? Even so, most guys, after you ejaculate, <gasps> it goes down. This thing, this thing stays as hard as you want for so it, then as how long does it as you want. Go down when you're like, I'm done. So there's two okay. buttons. There's two. There, no, there's two buttons. There's a de- inflate and then there's a deflate. So th- one of the companies that makes this, they're actually creating a new device where it's Bluetooth. Oh, activated. So there's but no is more that pump. not going to be bad to have Bluetooth? Yeah. <laughs> Alexa, give my husband a boner. Exactly right. Exactly Having the Bluetooth right. there, is that not going to be bad for like, like f- considering you're saying keep heat away, keep your phone away from there? Is that not going to like mm, contradict everything contradict. you said about the the pump it's not going to be it's going to be higher up the the the, um, the right. valve that basically it's going to be higher up. so it's it's it won't be next to the testicles um, so they'll avoid that part of it um, but yeah I mean you could even have like a proximity sensor as soon as you come home Siri or Alexa, <laughs> like an NFC thing that you tap area. your balls so just, on and it's like yeah, okay yeah. it just uh, uh, automatically gets activated oh my goodness. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's it very would. common, right? This thing, insurance covers this. That's insanity. So it's super really? Common. Yeah, yeah. I probably do. I probably do two or three of them a week. That's. It's, it's for sure the most common surgery that I do. I mean, what's so interesting is there's a lot of talk about gender affirming surgeries and trans rights right now, and this is a gender affirming surgery. You know, it's it's your gender mm. that you were assigned at birth, but yeah. it is making you feel affirmed in that sexuality you know and this is covered by insurance the others should be it's making you affirmed for sure Mm -hmm. do you treat any trans patients like do you have women coming in who don't have bottom surgery um i don't have any in my practice only because there's somebody um locally who's Mm -hmm. very uh, he's he's the, uh, the main guy here in los angeles so he Mm-hmm. Um, he sees all those patients. His name is Maurice Garcia. Cool. We'll yeah. talk to Maurice. Maybe mm-hmm. that would be cool too. Um, yeah. So they do. They do the penile prosthesis for them too. So like, if somebody gets mm-hmm. a, yeah, you know that part. Yeah. So they'll get if they have a, uh, they get like a, a flap, like a penile flap, basically like a manufactured penis. They're able to. Down the road, they're able to put a, this penile prosthesis in them, so they're able oh, to pump it up. Oh, for trans men. And, yeah, for for female to yeah. male. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was thinking for um, trans women, maybe who like their estrogen has impacted their ability to get erections, and they still want to have sex. Would a prosthesis work for them as well? well? I mean, if they have the tissue, yeah. For the, if, mm-hmm. if they have like, yeah, for sure. So if you're doing if you're doing a couple of these a week and you're doing quite a few of the second these, like what other sort of surgeries are you offering that are quite common for penis owners? So circumcisions are a big one. Um, really? Yeah, adult circumcisions. Um, those are pretty common. Vasectomy reversals, and then there's um, one of my favorite surgeries is a varicose selectomy. So what that is is this is more for fertility. It's mm-hmm. um, 
so think of varicose veins of the testicles. So um, when blood is pooling around the testicles, it increases the temperature. So back to what we were talking about, it throws mm-hmm. off that temperature balance and it, it decreases their sperm counts or sperm, basically all those parameters we're talking about, it impairs those. So guys aren't able to have babies or have more difficulty having kids because of this these varicose seals. So uh, with a microscope, we go in there and we basically tie off these veins, these dilated mm-hmm. veins, and in doing so, um, their fertility parameters improve and then ultimately then generally they're able to have um kids much easier cool that's another one and then i'm a urologist i'm also a urologist so i do a lot of uh urologic surgeries as well the different you know kidney stones um prostate surgeries Mm. kidney surgeries so all that too kidney stones passing those that's allegedly the most painful thing ever they say it's worse than um vaginal delivery wow yeah What's the biggest yeah. kidney stone you've seen? <laughs> Just thinking about that now. <laughs> well, I saw, I saw one yesterday, actually, eight centimeters. Um, so basically fills up the Ooh. whole kidney. The whole kidney is filled up with kidney stones. So, I mean, you have to approach those much differently. Um, and they pass yeah, those, that? No, 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 no. I was, no. That oh, okay, was okay, okay. reverse no, of a snake no. eating a tennis ball. I mean, they could, sometimes they barely pass a stone that's five millimeters. I mean, this is yeah. eight centimeters. So this is like 80, 80 millimeters. It's huge. So you have to go in there surgically in different ways. Basically, you have to go in from their side and, bla- okay. and use a laser, destroy the stone, and then clean up, take out all the remnants. Destroy the stone. Mm. Yeah. Very Marvel. Yeah, kidney stones are very common too. Um, how do you know that you have them? You're having severe flank pain. So pain in like your upper back, uh-huh. upper back to the side, not in the middle, but on the sides. You would have very mm-hmm. bad pain and it comes and goes. It's a type of pain that's not constant, but just comes. You feel these like pulses. Very, very severe. Okay. So if you're feeling that, call somebody. And yeah. the stones themselves, they're like hard, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're yeah. stones. They're stones, right? So they're it's like, like, it's like a rock. It's like a rock. That it's, sounds not that vaginal birth isn't horrible, but at least the baby's got soft skin. <laughs> what is. Pyrenees disease. Is, am I pronouncing it? Pyrenees? Pyrenees? Oh, Pyrenees. Mm, Pyrenees. Pyrenees is when guys have curvature to their penis. Mm. Yeah. So um, it happens for one of two reasons. Either it's genetic. Guys have generally Northern European ancestry. At some point in their 50s, 60s, or 70s, all of a sudden their penis just starts getting crooked. Um, Wilts. <laughs> yeah. Or, or trauma. Just- so, oh, um, oh, you know, sometimes you miss the hole and right. you feel it. You feel it. Like, ah, you, you just feel that mm-hmm. little burn. And, mm-hmm. you know, you get these micro tears in the, the erectile body. And then your body will basically try to heal that up. And the way to think about peronies, it's like a piece of duct tape mm-hmm. on a balloon. When the balloon's mm-hmm. expanding, that, that piece of duct tape doesn't expand. So then you get the curve. So historically, um, there were two ways of treating this. We were we did medic oral medications, which didn't really do anything to cure it. It basically stabilized it, um, mm-hmm. so it, it, it would prevent it. Like sometimes you see guys come in with like literally a ninety degree curvature, right? So you, there's no way you're having sex with that thing. It's Captain literally Hook. curved. Like, yeah, yeah. It's like it looks like a corkscrew. There's no way you could do anything. Oh, with that my, thing. Like a duck. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Do you know about duck penises? <laughs> They've got oh, what is that? corkscrew penises. They're like a and corkscrew. The female duck has reverse on the inside and they like, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Look it up. Look at a picture of it. I have to look that up. It'll blow your mind. Again, just find a partner with a curved butthole. Vagina. Or- yeah. Vagina. Yeah. <laughs> find your match. Just put it in your Tinder profile. Just put yeah. exactly what you're looking for in looking your Tinder for profile. Curved. I'm, I'm sure Sagittarius and I've got a curve <laughs> and I'm vaxxed. Yeah. Perfect. Oh my gosh. So sorry, um, just if they've got Pyrenees, well, if like some penises have a normal curve in them, like that's just how they've always been. How can you distinguish if it's like yeah. changed into something you should be concerned about? Mm. So you're right. There's there's physiologic, like basically congenital curvature. Like most guys mm. have a little bit of upward bend, right? And guys like that yeah. actually. There's, you know, it's a tickler, they call it. So that upward bend. But if you've had that your whole life, that's, you know, that's who you we are. Like but, it too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's a reason why. Yeah. But, um, 
<laughs> some guys all of a sudden, like I said, in their 50s, 60s, or 70s, they just notice this thing. It's bending and it hurts, right? There's a part, mm-hmm. part of the penis when they're getting erect, it hurts. And that's when they usually come in. So um, medications don't really, you know, they don't really do anything. Surgery, we used to do a lot of surgery for this because it was the only option. Uh, basically bend it back the other way, but that shortened the penis. Now we mm. have a great option where we inject an enzyme directly into the plaque, into that piece of duct tape, if you will, and it breaks mm-hmm. it up and then the, the penis basically straightens out. It's like, ah, mm-hmm. relieve the cramp. Amazing. Yeah. So yeah. you don't really see this in like Yeah, younger- it's common too patients they usually on like 50 up no no. only if they're slamming into that wall too many times keep missing yeah you gotta keep missing dating somebody with vaginismus you might get (laughs) payronies yeah you might do broken penises exist because like um i remember there was this movie in the 90s called the new guy Mm -hmm. this guy has his penis broken in half and it like ruins his life for a few months. Is that a real thing? Yeah. It's called a penile fracture. Okay. So, so even though there's no bone. Yeah. So, so the, the penis, the way it works is you have these, these erectile bodies, these two erectile bodies, right. That basically fill up with blood. Mm -hmm. They get engorged and then, you know, the blood stays there. You have an erection. And then when, after you ejaculate, the blood dissipates, the blood goes away and it goes down. Now, you know, what we were talking about earlier, if you miss that hole, um, it could put pressure on that lining, that, that balloon, the mm-hmm. outer layer, that balloon. And sometimes if you put too much pressure on it, that balloon could pop. Mm. So it's called a penile fracture. And, um, and that's an emergency, right? And th- the thing is, you know, you have to take him to the OR immediately. Yeah, he was rushed to the hospital like, you know, on the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that never happens during regular hours. Never. Okay. Right? Always happens in the middle of the night. Always. Like <laughs> one or two a.m. and it's never you know the guy always comes in by himself whether he's married or not he always comes in by himself so it usually happens with somebody they're not proud that it's happening with so they come in the middle of the night you always have yeah you have to take him to the or you have to close it you have to close that hole in the balloon and then you know have to take care of it actually had one over the weekend saturday night or sunday morning Wild times yeah. in LA. <laughs> yeah, I could see a lot of those happening in LA. So wait, what's the recovery time from like surgery after that? Yeah. To fix that. How long are they like out for? Uh, a couple weeks. Um, it depends. So how bad the injury is. Sometimes the injury is so bad it breaks the the, the pee hole, the urethra. It basically it creates a hole oh in the god. urethra too. So you have to close that. Yeah. Sometimes the injuries are really bad. Oh um, my god. But if it's if it's it's relatively straightforward, you probably they're um, they'll be out for anywhere from two to four weeks, and then generally at that point they can start having sex again. And you're advised, obviously, not to get a boner in this time, right? Inevit- inevitably, they do, it's right? Inevitable. Guys are always getting nighttime, yeah, right. nighttime erections. Guys are always getting okay, nighttime erections, know. yeah, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I was just That's thinking healthy. about like when I got my nose job, I had to have my sister stay away from me because she'd make me laugh too hard. And I was like, I don't want you to fuck up the surgery. <laughs> yeah, so don't be, you can't have, it's okay if you get erections for this. It's not a problem. But don't act on the thing. I would not. Right. Mucho dolor with that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how can men stay on top of their overall sexual health? Like what should they look out for? That's a good question. It's, I would say it's a few things and it's, it's really simple, right? For mm-hmm. sexual health, it's really easy. It, lifestyle wise, it's it's pretty basic. It's eat, sleep and move, right? Eating wise, it's just having a good balanced diet. I would say, you know, in terms of diet, and I'm sure everyone's kind of talked about it, or people always say this anyway, but you know, most of your food should be leafy greens, um, vet, fruits and vegetables, um, about a quarter of each meal that you eat should be a protein, a lean protein, and then maybe 10% of it, have it be a carb. Mm. That's from a food standpoint. From an exercise standpoint, at least 15 minutes of, of intense cardio, of, at least 75 minutes of intense cardio every week. Mm-hmm. So you could balance that out over the course of um, uh, day by day. And then sleeping wise, try to get at least seven hours of sleep. That's that's um, the lifestyle stuff. Does now, sex this count is a big as one cardio? That, you know, it, it not really. They've okay. done studies on this where um, it depends. I think it depends, but it doesn't burn a lot of calories. I used to think I used to think sex burns a ton of calories. It um, working. it doesn't burn as many as. Huh. Yeah, I mean, it dep- I guess it depends on who you are and how much how active you are. But um, 
I used to think it burns a lot more calories than it really does. I think I read something recently. It only burns like four calories per minute, which mm. is very little compared to like real exercise. Yeah. The, the big one, and this is a, re- a lot of reason why guys come into my clinic is porn, right? Pornography. Mm. Um, right. They watch a ton of porn and it just messes with their mental, um, their perception, mm. their expectations around real sex. Mm. Uh, so one thing I would tell guys is, look, I'm not going to tell you don't watch porn because you know it's all around there. It's very easy to get access to it. But for every – a sex therapist has said this to me. I thought it was brilliant. For every two times you watch porn to masturbate, one time um, use your creativity. right? Yeah. Use, just use your mental – Yeah. Right. Just do it without any pornography or anything. That way you maintain that um, creativity in your own mind and you normalize and you lower some of the – or you normalize things. Mm-hmm. Everything becomes a little bit more normal mm-hmm. that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, and then what are some signs that they, if they come across, they should go see a doctor about? From a sexual health standpoint, yeah. um, if you're experiencing any of these issues, right, whether it's erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, delayed ejaculation, and it's, I would say it's nor. look, first of all, it's normal to experience these things. Mm-hmm. 40% of guys below the age of 40 at some point have had erectile dysfunction. Like no one's getting super strong directions every single day of, of their lives, right? Mm-hmm. But if it is impairing, if it's leading to a lack of self-confidence, if it's impairing your relationship with yourself, impairing your relationship with your partner, mm-hmm. then seek advice. You know, there's there's tons of outlets out there. Men's health, you know, men's specialists like myself, this is a lot of what we do. Um, but if it is causing distress, like I said, internally or with the ones around you, then seek seek advice because there's there's, Great options. Totally. Great, great options. Um, yeah. And so just to get back to the new male birth control, it works by reducing testosterone levels. Um, what levels are normal and what levels would it decrease it to? I'd have to check what levels it decreases it, decreases it to, mm-hmm. but normal levels, depending on what age group you're in, but normal levels um, in the mid 400s to... Um, like the 900s to 1000s, I'd say for most, um, those are the normal levels. If you're below that, um, you're on that low normal range, you start to experience some symptoms of low testosterone at that, eight, at that range. But um, I have to look at how low it actually lowers the uh, the testosterone. Levels Can you increase one. your testosterone levels normally, like uh, naturally rather? Like are there ways to bring them up or lower them yeah. if you wanted to without? Yeah, yeah. So testosterone is a big you know, testosterone is huge, right, for all guys. And as we age, our testosterone levels go down, and it leads to we become more we become more angry, we become more become more depressed, become more moody. We're sleeping more, erections aren't great, libido isn't great. Um, you're more anxious. Um, testosterone is great. I mean, you see the young guys. I mean, you see older guys coming in. They have low testosterone. You boost up their testosterone levels, and then they feel like a new man. They're like seeing the world in a different light. Um, so older, you know. I would say this, it's, it's easy for us to boost your testosterone by giving you synthetic testosterone, right? Injections, gels, pellets, there's nasal sprays now. That's easy to do. But um, the harder part is naturally boosting it. And the ways to do that, I mean, exercise is really the key one. And it's the big muscle groups, in the back, the chest, the legs. So if you're doing a lot of deadlifts, uh, squats, bench press, those will boost your testosterone levels. Sleep. It's a huge component of testosterone, getting at least seven hours of sleep. They've done numerous studies on that. That shows if you're getting five to six hours of sleep, your testosterone levels are that of a guy who's like 10 years older than you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's different supplements out there that you could take to you know, natural over-the-counter supplements that could help boost your testosterone. Um, but yeah, if you are experiencing low testosterone, just get a blood test. The best way of diagnosing that is a blood test. And then you could see where you're at and um, what you could do to improve it. Cool. Do you think that the hormonal male birth control will be a good option? I mean, to be honest, I'd have to look more into it to mm-hmm. see what it, um, the, I think short term, it sounds like it's great, but you always want to make sure the long term side effects aren't too severe. Because if it is decreasing your testosterone levels, you know, I, I know what it's like to have low testosterone levels. I see it day in and day out. Mm-hmm. That could really mess with the guy's libido mood energy levels all of that so um oh you mean the same side effects as our pill oh my goodness that'd be tragic (laughs) yeah yeah god forbid right yeah i I think i saw that they 
they would have less side effects, which I hope I hope it does become an option for people to, again, share the burden of not having children before you're ready. Yeah. Yeah. And you want to make sure it works well, right? The efficacy rates are high because we have a good option right now and that's a vasectomy. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, that's almost, almost a hundred percent if done right. So, um, but it's not entirely normalized. Like, do you think that male birth control, like it's mostly been on people with uteruses up to this point to like, have all the responsibility. Do you think male birth control options are going to become more normalized? Definitely. Mm These younger generations, I think they're much more, you know, I don't know if empathetic is the right word, but I hope you you see, you see the, yeah, but it's along those lines of empathy. I think younger guys are seeing the, that things are a little bit mismatched in terms of the burden and the responsibility. So, Mm -hmm. um, they're much more willing to take on some of the responsibility associated with not, you know, not having a kid, whether it's a vasectomy mm-hmm. or a pill, a pill for birth control, whatever it is. But yeah, definitely, it's going to become more pop- more popular. No question about it. Yeah, I also think like we had a lot of people when we asked the question, "How do you feel about male birth control?" and they were like, "I don't know if I trust them to take it." But I feel like we've been hearing that like narrative from guys for a while being like, oh, how do I know that she's not going to trap me with a baby? And it's like, well, if you're shooting blanks, there's no baby, yeah, you know, no baby it, it kind of puts with. the responsibility on that person to be like, yeah, I don't want to have a baby. So I'm not going to have a baby. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to get a vasectomy or do something to prevent that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You take responsibility in your own hands. It's, mm-hmm. it's empowering in many ways. It's totally empowering. Um, this has been such a yeah. fun conversation. I wish we could keep you all day, but we know we've got you've got lots of things to tend to and lots of penises people's to lives to make better. Lots of penises to pump. <laughs> um, Dr. Human, uh, thank you so much for being here. Can you tell everybody where they can find you and uh, your practice? Yeah, so well, thanks for having me. Um, of course. You can find me on social media, justin.human.md on Instagram, or you could just Google me. Um, you know, YouTube channel, Twitter, um, all over the social media, but H O U M A N is how you spell my last name. And if you have any questions, you could just reach out through the various messaging options on those platforms. Perfect. Um, I have to ask this to you after a sexual experience, which this has been relatively sexual. Hmm. Um, Dr. Human, did you finish? Fin- oh, big time. I fin- oh, strong, strong. I fin- oh, finished, great. Finished very well. That's amazing. <laughs> Forza. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. It's great coming. Thank okay, you. If anyone has any more questions or anything, would you be down to come back for like a little Patreon interview or something just to yeah. cover some more questions? Because I'm Definitely. sure that there'll be plenty after this. Definitely. Yay. And uh, we'll see you next time on How Come. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. It's not you, it's me. I try so hard to finish honestly. They say you'll know. When you go all the way from A right down to O Oh no I think that I still got a ways to go Oh oh I'm sick of this and I have got to know How come? How come? How come I can't achieve? How come I can't achieve? I'm rolling up my sleeves. I'm rolling up my sleeves. Oh, baby, I believe these guests can help. Cause I can do it by myself. I wanna jizz. Where are you guys located? I'm in New York. She's in the UK right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm everywhere at the moment. Nice. I'm actually in my, my dad's yeah. doctor's office right now. Like, my dad's a doctor, so this is his office. You're kidding. <laughs> what kind of doctor is he? He is a derm and general surgeon. Wow. Smart guy. Mm-hmm. Smart guy. Smart man. Smart. We love. Yeah. He's the- Although he ate my food this morning and I'll never forgive him. Oh. <laughs>